case may be. Whew. I've been curious how this morning is going to go because I thought very likely I was not going to get through the message. And uh, that may be the way it ends up. So we'll take and stop where we appear to be best to stop. Communion will be after, after uh, events, uh, after the message somewhere, and so will the offering. Everybody know where we're at this week? We've been at it for weeks. So, it's the beginning, the title is the beginning 109. So that tells you we've had one through one, 101 through 107. Eight. So, I was acute. I was. It was said that I don't run much for reviews. So you notice I've been running some reviews, and I'm going to keep these very brief, as a whole. So 101 started out this way: He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. That's First Corinthians 6:17, and and we're sanctified and perfected forever, blameless. Exactly, and we'll share that a little more as we move into these reviews. 102, uh, Philemon 1.6 saying this, the way to communicate your faith effectually is to acknowledge every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. Now understand, these were all sermons or all messages uh, that come from these verses. In 103, is 1 Peter 1.23, Jesus, the incorruptible, eternal word, died as seed to produce after his kind. That, is, that should register and score and just cause us to vibrate. Because he, as the incorruptible seed, died to bring forth seed after his kind. Who did he bring forth? You and I. All right. And that made us, Romans 8, 17, come to the, we're joint heirs. It's more than heirs, we're joint heirs with Christ. And then, on the screen, you'll see this verse. Uh, 104, well, in Lesson 104, it is 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24. And the very God of peace, the very God of peace himself, sanctify you holy. Who sanctifies you holy? The very God of peace. All you do. What's my responsibility? What do I have to do? Present yourself. It's not complex. You cannot, you cannot receive that by any effort works of your own. Won't happen. Or you'll be working on your own from now until you decide it isn't going to work. Well, will I change my life? Perhaps. But that's not what's going to make you have you receive. We've got to come to the places that, that we actually recognize it's not based on our performance. Our performance will change our actions, but it's changed because of what's happened to us, because of the divine source. All right. So, the very God of peace himself, I put in there because that's where the sanctify you holy, complete. And I pray your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless. You suppose that whole don't work for, for soul and body? I think it does myself. But I wouldn't debate it with you. I just pray your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved what? blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then he goes back and says, faithful is he that calleth you or invited you, who will what? Also do it. Boy, I... he promises it and then promises it again. That he will do it. 105. And this is one that I would... That that this world we live in would recognize, as well as the rest of them, but that is 1 Corinthians 6:19 through 20, but 
is verse 19 that I want to put the emphasis on. Uh, what I know, what? Know ye not that your body is a temple of the, of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God. Ye are not your own. Ye are brought with a price. In verse 20. Now that's a radical view in the world we live in, that our bodies don't belong to us. But in the body of Christ, it should be a common thing. In Lesson 106, 2 Peter 1.4, and this one is, to me, where'd that one? I like that one. Hold it right there. It... <laughs> I think, where'd it go? <laughs> where'd it go? Where'd it go? 1 Corinthians 2.4, I think. It, is, that, what, is that what it was? 1.4? I don't know. My speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Is that what it says? My speech and preaching was not with enticing words. This is Paul talking. I mean, he is full of it. Enticing words. He, he had them. He had, all, he, he had great knowledge. But he put them aside the, of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and the power. I got interviewed one time, and I told you this. I got interviewed one time by a denomination. And uh, I was a radical. I was, I think, the second free Methodist through there that day, and you could tell it didn't go good with the first one. Because <laughs> the guy sitting behind the desk was just a tad on the borderline of being a uh, Christian cranky. <laughs> if there is such a thing. And so he was ready for me. And he said, he checked me out, you know. What's your education? I told him. He says, how do you preach? And by this time, me being a sensitive fellow, <laughs> you know, that has this little spark inside yet, I thought, well, fella, hang on. And I won't say, gotcha, but, <laughs> but in, into my system comes this statement right here. I said, not with enticing words of man's wisdom, He looked at me perplexed. The assistant superintendent for the state of Michigan was sitting right at my right who has been very quiet through this whole thing. And I figured if that guy sitting behind the desk was cool, he should be able to finish the verse. And he couldn't. And the guy sitting beside me, the assistant superintendent, with a smile on his face says, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. I said, that's it. Well, not much happened from that interview. <laughs> okay. So, there you are. I did see the assistant superintendent. I was holding revival in one of his churches uh, in this particular denomination later. <laughs> he was in a restaurant. For some reason, he was in a restaurant. And a bunch of these pastors. And I was, happened to be invited to go along with the pastor that we were, whose church we was in. And, of course, I recognized the superintendent, and he walked by, and the pastor said, do you know Lynn Winans? And the guy got this smile and said, yes, I know Lynn Winans. <laughs> and that was the end of that conversation. Uh, and nobody else brought it up either. So anyhow, are we still on 106? Well, let's go to 106, 2 Peter 1, 4, saying this, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. <coughs> I didn't say that. The Word of God says that. Partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Going back and starting to research, and I thought to myself, I would not tell you this part again, but I don't always do, think, I'm going to give it to you. See the exceeding greatness? It's only used once in the New Testament. Only once in this setting right here. 
exceeding greatness. The end result of this word in Greek is megas. Webster says of the Greek word megas is mega. Now, here's how it goes. It's a comparison. And in dimensions, this is Thayer's, in dimensions it's greater, more spacious, longer, higher, larger, more abundant, stronger, of greater intensity, greater ability, greater virtue, greater authority, greater power. In other words, this exceedingly great is the greatest that provides for you a, a, a divine, his divine nature. It's not yours, it's his. And I propose to you, it abides in your inner man. 107. Philippians 3.20. Our citizenship is in heaven. Got that? Our conversation is our citizenship is in heaven from whence we look for the Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. If we, when we get that mindset that we're citizens of heaven, not of this world, it'll be a, a, a dramatic, dramatic happening in each and every one of us. You know, I think we'll actually want people to go along with us. A brief review of 108, and this is where we were last week, 1 John 4:17, And we spent quite a bit of time on this. Herein is our love made perfect, complete, finished, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. That's future. Look at We can have that because as He is. How is He today? How is Jesus today? Good. Good. Just leave it good. Because as He is, so are we in this world. My, isn't that something? And we went on to elaborate. Jesus took us with Him to the cross. He took, hang on, are you ready? Are you ready? I, all of a sudden, I just went back in time to Isaiah 53. I just went back there. You see, Isaiah 53, he took that to the cross. What is that? Our griefs? Our sorrows? Our pains? Our sickness? Our stress? Our iniquities? Jesus came forth from the grave and made us he took that with him and came forth from the grave and made us the provision for as he is, so are we in this world. There's a place for all that which troubles you or troubles, tries to trouble any of us. Then, I don't want to spend a lot of time with this, but I think we're going to spend some. Because last week, I tried to incorporate something Joseph Prince said along with L.L. L. Winans' comments and I didn't plan on spending much time with it and I did not. So on the way out, Denise says, would you give me a copy of that? <laughs> so with that then, I don't know if she'll want a copy of this today because I'm never happy if I give a snapshot of something that doesn't include more. And so that was the outcome of my thoughts. And so, with divine permission, and we're going to go and do some of that right now. We're going to think about the crown of thorns Jesus wore. All right? Remember that? John 19.2, I think it's in probably most of the Gospels, that he wore a crown of thorns. But where did those thorns come from? We'll go back in time to Genesis 3, 17, 18, and 19. And unto Adam he said, Because you hearkened unto the voice of thy wife and has eaten of the tree. That tree was a forbidden tree to partake of the fruit. All right? It has eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Have you ever heard divine instructions, thou shall not? Have you ever heard that? And of course you were instantly obedient, weren't you? 
Diane is righteously shaking her head and smiling. Denise is a little more skeptical, you know. And, and Gary's over here chuckling. Some of us have blown it. All right? We talked about, didn't we talk about Marty's dog last week? I'm just going to tell you, how many times have you acted like the dog out in the middle of the field with the master calls, and you sit out in the middle of the field looking at what the master is saying versus where you want to go? Which way do you go? Well, I think that should be self-evident. Okay, so the result of this then is, Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow thou shalt eat it of it all the days of your life. Now, sorrow is worrisomeness. You ever just been worried? In a state of anxiety? Huh? You kind of labor and toil. And I mean, you get put to the place where you're in pain over it. Sometimes you break right down and ball like a baby. I don't know where that comes from, but that's yours. That's not in here. You curl up in a knot and whimper. Mm, 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 mm. Okay, thou shalt eat of it all the days of thy life. I will, I will say this. There may be a bit of a reprieve. I'll leave it for the Old Testament scholars. Because when Noah, about 1,750 years after this quote, Noah, there was a, there was said this. It may be a bit of relief from this curse of the ground, the thorns and the sizzles. He says, there will be seed time and harvest. Always seed time and harvest. I asked Brian, I said, you got your crops all in? He said, I can't even get on my soybean field. I sink to my ankles. This year he's got rain. Now I understand his father-in-law has got his buckwheat in. <laughs> but, but he lives on top of a hill <laughs> and he gets the runoff. Brian don't live at the bottom of the hill by any chance, but there you are. So in verse 18 it says this, somewhere in here. Uh, See that word, thorns? Also, and thistles shall bring it forth to thee. What? The ground. Thorns and thistles. Mm -mm -mm. And thou shalt eat of the herbs of the field. Mm -hmm. So, the thorns and thistles affects production. Would that be right? You allow thorns and thistles in your life and it affects production. It it affects relationship. However, I said or didn't say that. These guys harass me. Just for the record, John and Aunt Wilma and Cousin Lois, Connie too. Sometimes they pick on me. Uh, it's true. It, it, it is absolutely true. They, they, they pick on me. I was talking to Brother Larry on the phone. He was in Ohio. And uh, <laughs> they will give me Kleenex now. But anyhow, I was talking to him last night. I said, my son-in-law, my son-in-law, my grandson, and Bill, no less. Bill, you know, who doesn't say much. They both harassed me about sound effects. And I said, Larry, sound effects. I've been sending them CDs, you know. <laughs> and I said, there's not a one of them planned them sound effects. He says, um, you do share them, don't you? <laughs> I said, now I add Larry to the list. Okay. I just, I, I tell you, I, I enjoy, just flat enjoy, because I've been known to bother some people. So it's all right if they bother me. I will not go to break down and cry over it. So, but all living things eat and all perform a service, just the way it is. In sweat of thy face shall you eat bread 
till thou return to the ground, for out of it thou hast taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. And these verses are all about obedience, disobedience, efforts, how you earn a living, what you're going to eat, and how you get what you're going to eat. And they're important to all of us. Are they not? They are. But this is all due to the fact that Adam and Eve removed and ate the fruit of the forbidden tree. Now just look at this. We go to Galatians 3, 13 and verse 14. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. What was thorns? Curse. Being made a curse for us. Who became a curse in place of that curse? Jesus. For it is written, Cursed is ever one that hangeth on a tree. Lo and behold, it says, it's not a part of these notes, I'll just add it in. Uh, Galatians, uh, what is it, 520? I am? Is that what? I am or I have been crucified with Christ? Whoops. I am or I have been crucified with Christ. Christ took it to the tree of the cross. He took me and you there with him. There's... Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Mm-mm-mm. Get that? There's a, there is availability of relief from that curse. God's Son in love and obedience, the second Adam, as a substitute, took our curse obtained by the first Adam. And the second Adam, God's son, God's fruit, he was what? He is the first fruit? Is he? He is the first fruit. Oh, boy. Jesus was placed as back on the tree wearing a crown of thorns. You ever thought about that? How does that affect me? He's t- the fruit of the curse was returned to the tree. Is that right? Dale come across this truth months ago. He took away the curse due us, including wearing thorns that the earth produced. He not only took our sin, he took, he took the curse in its totality and took it to the cross with him, along with us. Why? Here is here. Verse 14. Why did he do that? That the blessings of Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Probably not a one of us here this morning are not familiar with Deuteronomy 28, first 15 verses. Some of you perhaps could quote them. I can't, so I'm going to read them. And the verses you see on the screen will not be the whole that I'm going to read, but it will be selected verses for a reason. Beginning at verse 2. And all these blessings shall come to thee, If I read that exactly and overtake thee, they're on your trail. They're hunting you down. Is that true? Absolutely. That's what they're doing. They'll overtake thee. Oops, 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 IF. If thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Can we promote him to say, I believe what he says? That may be part of what Roger will say to you next week, because we was talking there, and I don't mean to be preaching his, but I, you know, sometimes it's very difficult for us to accept what he says. We want to move him down to our level, and that's dangerous, because what you're doing is giving up the provision or the position that he has, has been chosen for you. Why would we do that? I just get, I get 
sometimes I go to say something and don't do that because it's not the position or the statement or the provision that Jesus has bought for us. I, I'm not going to run around and take a position contrary to him. Okay? I'm going to agree with him. I'm going to agree with him. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to agree with him. I, Kay called me the other morning, and I, I thought, i sure like to see them get out of this situation without it costing them a lot of money. Looks like God's working on it. Of course, I wasn't the only one praying. I expect there's people praying all over the building. Is he able to do these things? Yes, he is. So where are we at? We're in verse 2. How about verse 3? Blessed shalt thou be in the city, and blessed, and blessed thou shalt be where? <laughs> in the field. That's where, that, that's where them thorns and thistles go, boop, where to pop up. There's sound effect. <laughs> okay. And blessed shall thou be in the field. You don't need thorns and thistles in your field. Thistles. That's what they've been chuckling about for half an hour back there. And they're trying to say thistles. <laughs> I do enjoy it. <laughs> let, them, let them smile because they know exactly what I'm saying. Okay. So, blessed thou shall be in the field. There you go. Verse 4. Blessed shall you be the fruit of thy body, the fruit of thy, what? Ground. You see, the seed of Abraham came to us, and we became that seed. Is that true? That's absolutely right. And this is the blessings that come to Abraham. Was he blessed? Yes, he was. Okay, fruit of the ground. And the fruit of the cattle, and the increase of thy kind, and the flocks of thy sheep. Not many of us are sheep farmers, but be that as it may. Verse 5 says, Blessed thou shall basket in your store. And I'm more familiar with the store. I told Ruth years ago, all this stuff comes <laughs> in the store. <laughs> okay? Some of you would disagree with me, but there you go. Verse 6 saying, Blessed shall you be when you comest in. Blessed thou shall be when you goest out. And verse 7, the Lord shall cause thine enemies to rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face. And go out and, out, uh, and come out against thee one way and flee before you seven ways. Verse 8. Whew. And the Lord shall command the blessing. What shall the Lord do? What? Command. Command the blessing upon thee in the storehouse. Cool. And all that thou settest thy hand unto, that includes your occupation. All right? Your storehouse. And he shall bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Now you say, well, just a minute, Lynn. Land means their national, place of national origin. Yep, country, nation but it includes ground. It includes your field within that nation. Wow. Which the Lord thy God had given thee. And look at there. He gives down here. He commands it to come there. Is that true? That's true. It really becomes kind of simplistic. Uh... Take him into your environment and expect him to change so that he can command the blessings to your storehouse, to all you set your hand unto, and shall bless you in the land. I don't care if you're not a farmer. I tell you, he works in grocery stores. Even though I got a chance to tell kids I was going to hang them on a hook and various things like that, you know. I don't know if Lois knows that, but one of her grandkids, I... You know. 
Yeah. There's a hook back here. I'll take it back here and hang it on it. Oh, I wasn't going to stick him. I just thought, you know, I, I, did, I never did it. You understand? But, oh, well, you say, well, that's pretty mean. Yeah, probably some people think so. Why did I confess that then? <laughs> Bless. I lived my life for the first 10, 15 years we was married in a store. And God blessed it. I, I, I just, I don't know how to describe what he did. He did phenomenal things. Phenomenal things. He took a store that nobody could manage. It, one guy went out with a heart attack and the next two were fired. The third guy in was L.L. himself. Fourth guy in. I lived. I'm still here. And that sword turned around. Altogether different. Everything changed. But we was back giving him praise, honor, and glory. We was back worshiping him. We were back allowing him to be in charge. I actually hired people because God told me that one. I'd ask him. You know, you say, well, you're just plain strange. He's interested in all the things that affect your life. Why should you not include him in a decision-making practice? I, I, I had this one kid, and he, he went to school in Holland, and he says, can you call the manager down? I said, yeah, I can do that. So I called him. I knew this guy was tougher than bull beef at 20 cents a pound, and I thought I was a gentle dude compared to him. And that guy called me back. He says, this guy's no good. I says, hang on, fella. You know, he's done me great service from the time I hired him. However it went in that conversation. He'd be quiet and work. That's it. That's what he did. I can stand that. I can even stand those that talk to me and want to go out for ice cream on company time. Huh? <laughs> you bring me something. Yes, yeah, she did. <laughs> okay. And, and me being absolute putty where the, some of them people were concerned, the way they'd go and back they'd come. Uh, as long as we had more than enough time to get our work done. So there you are. Uh, <laughs> I didn't plan on that, Marlon, not at all. Okay. Where are we at, anyhow? Eight? Did we do nine? The Lord shall establish a holy people unto himself, and he shall swoon unto thee if thou... You will do what? I wish I looked that word up. What does it say, Gary? Oh, we don't have it on the screen, do we? Swoon. You ever looked it up? In Deuteronomy 28.9, it says he shall swoon. I think he's talking about God. 28.9. Swoon. That's, you got it? See? 28.9. You look it up while I go on. And you wave at me when you, when you flag me down. Okay. All right. Let me read it again. The Lord shall establish thee a holy people unto himself, as he swooned unto thee, sworn unto you. Okay, I got it. There you go again. You know, and that was, to I want to tell you something, that's totally unplanned too. <laughs> Can we have fun? <laughs> now I, it's not two or three that's looking at me. Okay, I sworn. All right, I got these bifocals turned in. Sworn. Thou shalt keep thy commandments of the Lord thy God and walk in his ways. Verse 10. And all the people of the earth shall see that thou art called by the name of the Lord and they shall be afraid of thee. Whoo! <laughs> now, jesting is well and good, but... 
and people wiping tears out of their eyes and so on. They go, yeah, I want to tell you something. I might even have a couple. Okay. Verse 11, I think we have that on the screen. And the Lord shall make thee plenteous in goods in the fruit of thy body and in the fruit of the cattle and in the fruit of thy ground. You wonder why the Christian appears to be blessed? Look at what he stands in. In the land which the Lord swear thee unto the fathers to give thee. You cannot, you cannot outgive them. I, I've told you this before. That same store that I was telling you about, it gained leaps and bounds, and there was another store, a bigger store opened up, and I knew it should be mine, but I didn't want to go. I was having fun watching what God was doing to this one. And I kept my mouth shut. My boss come to me one day and he said, you know, Henry Street's open. He says, it really should be yours. He says, I want you to stay. I just looked at him. He says, mm. what we're giving the guy to go, the amount of what we're giving him to go, we'll just give it to you too, <laughs> to stay. I said, well, bless God. <laughs> you know, how do you beat this? When it got all done, the, the next guy said, I have never seen a record like this. He says, I have changed jobs and positions in this company and never in a year got the increases that you got. Okay, be that as it may. I tell you, he blesses. He's good. He's good. And in the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers, I got that word right. Okay, verse 12. <laughs> and the Lord shall make, and the Lord shall open unto thee the good treasure, the heaven to give thee rain unto thy land in his season, and to bless all the work of thy hand. And thou shalt lend unto many nations, and thou shalt not borrow. And I too bad that we not follow that as, as a nation. Reign unto thy land. Verse 13 and 14 I'll read and move on. And the Lord shall make thy head and make thee the head, not the tail. Thou shalt be above only, and thou shalt not be beneath. To hearken unto the commandments of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day to observe and to do them. And thou shalt not go aside from any of the words, thou shalt not go aside from any of the words, which I command thee this day to the right hand or to the left, to go after other gods and to serve them. And Jesus follows through with this theme when he comes to the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6, verse 31. Look at here he goes. Therefore, <laughs> see, he's already commanded the blessing to come, and he's given you the blessing according to the Abrahamic covenant. Therefore, take no thought. How many of you worry and stew and fret and carry on about tomorrow? Don't show hands. Don't do that. No. <laughs> Saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? How am I going to put clothes on my body? <laughs> Boy. He tells these, these Jews that Jesus is talking to, he says, unto all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. Verse 33. We can skip. Yeah, go on. 33. There we go. What does he tell us to do? It's not go out there and hoe your garden or your flower bed. You can hold your flower bed as all you want. Okay. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be what? Added unto you. All what? What you eat, what you drink, what you put on. Is, is the promises of the Lord good? You have gave your life to him for eternal life. 
Why would we not think he would take care of this life? We, we, we kind of separate the two. We do for a fact. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, firstly, in time, place, and order, or order of importance, and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Verse 34. He didn't get it in 33. He says, Take therefore no thought for tomorrow. Mm -mm -mm -mm. For tomorrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Now, hang on. I want to make this because probably most of us, or some of us at least, have seen this happen. This is not permission to quit work. This astounds me sometimes. People have been known to bless people with certain things, and those people take it as a sign they're supposed to quit work. That's got to be just bizarre. Just bizarre. You say, well, you're judging. Yeah, I am. I guess. You know. These are not things to quit work. Not at all. But you can be blessed while you're doing it, whatever you're doing. See, there's the principle behind this, is to be blessed doing what there is to do. Making it as easy and as comfortable for you as the provision provides. That's exactly right. And there comes a day when that's all you, you just go on into the sunset. That day's coming for all of us to go into the sunset. Now, I'm not talking about dying. I'm just talking about retirement, etc. So, it is instruction, though, to give up to him your stress, struggles, and anxieties. Can you give them? You know, I was thinking this morning. I was sitting in the office pondering. You know, some of us are in, some of us are in circumstances of our own making. Some of us are in circumstances that we really didn't get a vote. It was hoisted on us. But no matter how they come, the point is now, can I believe him to take care of my circumstances so that I don't have to dwell in stress, struggles, and anxiety? See, your father knows your need, and he says, seek first the kingdom of God. Make it yours and all these things and necessary things according to gives to you according to his measure should be added to you. What I'm trying to say about the crown of thorns worn by our substitute is speaking of an emotional rest. An emotional rest. You say, are you going to stop sweating? Hello. Not true in my case at this point. But I praise the Lord I can walk in, be at rest as much as I can be at rest, with no stress, no anxiety. Do you know what's going to happen? No, not necessarily. I will if he tells me. I don't. I'll go anyhow without worry, without stress, without anxiety. He said, where have you been? You've never known want. I beg your pardon. Green pork chops. That's probably about the worst it got, wasn't it? Can you remember? Did I ask you this before? Can you remember the green pork chops? And it must not because you still love pork chops. She loves pork chops. Broke? I can't describe to you how broke we were when Ruth went to the freezer and come back. She says we have nothing to eat other than this. Green pork chops. I sat there and pondered it a bit, and I said, fix them. You say, well, that was dumb. 
you know, they were past three days old or two days or, 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 you know, I've heard horror stories about this sort of thing. Fix them. She whipped them up. We sat down to eat. And we asked the blessing. There was no fake nothing. It was not a ritual, folks. <laughs> it was a living reality. So there you are. And then we had food. So there we are. Oh, my. Who's stressed this morning? You say, I'll be, who's stressed? Does work stress you or your circumstances stress you or something else is stressing you? Who's stressed? Jump to your feet. Anybody else? Well, there is, but I'll leave that up to you. Stand right there. You're going, what are you going to do? I'm not going to do anything. You're going to stand right there and I'm going to pray and you're going to sit down. <laughs> okay. Can I talk about our corner? I can. The other day, we, uh, when we was praising worship, I, I ended up over on that side of the room, leaning up against the wall, when here come Marla. And I thought, she said, would you pray for me? I thought, well, <laughs> I thought, well, well, we'll wait till it's done and we'll go up front. And then I remember Paul saying that he got the cart before the horse one time by just thinking he knew what the answer was. So I looked at Marla and said, do you, want, do you want me to pray now or later? Now's fine. So she got, actually, all the work, and I'd heard about it because I had an inside track that you had a bit of stuff to do. And uh, lo and behold, lo and behold, she reported, was it by Wednesday? It was by Wednesday. She said she just couldn't do it. She called somebody, and by the time they got done, it was at the state level, and they was doing it for her. <laughs> ah, uh. Yeah, it, it, he enters your environment and changes the circumstances. Isn't that a blessing? That is a blessing. Okay, we're going to pray. Wow. Father, we thank you. And praise you that your hand is not shortened. <laughs> no. The blessings of Abraham falls on to those who are the seed of Abraham, of which is represented here, standing up before you and seated before you. Walk into these lives and do a transforming work. Because love is perfected as you are, so are they in this world. No matter what set of circumstances have to change, what emotional systems have to be recalibrated, or what anxieties they face that cause them upheaval in their body and their person, none of these things are going to be the overriding issue. The overriding principle here is Jesus Christ. The name of Jesus. At the name of Jesus, everything must bow. Stress includes stress, anxieties, need, want. Time. All these things bow their knees to the name Jesus. Now, every one of these, Father, <laughs> that their circumstances bow, the thoughts bow, everything comes into divine conformity with a divine supply, which is Jesus Christ. Amen. Love perfected. Glory is true. We thank you for it. The praise, honor, and glory is yours. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father, for granting it all in Jesus' name. It's not our strength. No, sir. We don't even know what they are. But you orchestrate these things to the blessing of the people. It's true in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Now, at this point... I would have started the message for today. <laughs> but I'm not going to. For you that don't know, uh, Monday morning, Memorial Day morning, 
I got up and I went downstairs and he gave me an outline for Wednesday night, which I'd never hardly touched, more or less. And this morning, and so you can tell, only part of it did we get to all reviews. So I went downstairs in my basement and come out with seven binders from probably 30, 35 years ago. They're all typewritten, type, how do I say it anymore? They're typed by a typewriter, no less. And I know who the dude was that was on the end of it. So words are not always as they seem. But I come up with those seven binders and looked at them. And I found in the back of one three stories by Tony Campola. Com, Campola. Is that close? Anybody know him? Anyhow, he, he is... He, he travels the country and the world. And, but he got three stories, and I asked Ruth on the way to Grand Rapids in the afternoon one day, I said, can I take half a sermon and just tell stories? Because I wanted to get all three of them in. She looked at me kind of skeptically. And so I'm going to take time and share one with you. And if you want to see typewriter skills, you can look at this. Awesome. Not. And he's talking about Clarence Jordan, a friend of Tony's, went up in the hills of South Carolina to conduct a revival. And it was, the pastor was a hillbilly preacher. And I want to share this with you. And he says he described going to the church to conduct a revival, a meeting in the back hills of South Carolina. This was back in the 50s, mid 50s, when segregation was practiced, racism was all too common. He says, when Clarence got up to preach, he looked out over the congregation and much to his amazement, set black and white together. He says, when he got done, he said, first he couldn't believe what he saw. He wondered how such a thing could happen. So following the service, he asked the old hillbilly preacher that was the pastor of the church, how did it get this way? The old hillbilly preacher answered, what way? Clarence says, you know, integrated, blacks and white together. Has this come about because of the Supreme Court decision on integration? The old preacher said, Supreme Court, what's he got to do with Christians? <laughs> you know, move that up to 2013. But anyhow, <laughs> good question. Maybe the, pe maybe the people of this world need the Supreme Court to tell them the, the that discrimination is wrong, but the Bible already spoken to Christians about such matters. <laughs> a lot of matters the Bible's talked to us about. Come on, said Clarence. You know, you got a weird church here. How did it get to be this way? Well, the preacher said, I used to have about 20 members in this church when the last preacher died. And there was... <laughs> There's hundreds and hundreds of people out there now, Clarence said. That's right, said the preacher. When the old preacher died, they couldn't get a new preacher? No how. None. So after about two months, I told the deacons, I'd be the new preacher since they didn't have anybody else. They agreed. He says, I got up the next Sunday, opened my Bible, put my finger down, and landed on the verse that says, In Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek. Bond or free, male or female, all are one in Christ Jesus. So I preached on that. <laughs> the old preacher said, I told the people how Jesus made all kinds of people one. When I finished, the deacons told me they wanted to talk to me in the back room. And when the deacons got there, they told me they didn't want to hear anything like that ever, ever again, no more. Clarence said, what did you, what'd you tell them? What did you do? The old, Billy said, old hillbilly said, I fired the deacons. <laughs> if a deacon, if, if, if you need, we see if um, My other cousin is out there for Aunt Wilma. Is it about time for him? Well, take a look, if you would, please. Are you supposed to pick her up? Are you going to pick her up here or home?
Let me solve this. I'll be back. I got the cart before the horse. Okay, so here, here's. I fired those deacons. I mean, if a deacon's not going to deek, he ought to be fired. <laughs> so there he was. Clarence was amazed. How come the deacons didn't fire you? They never hired me, said the preacher, you know. Once I found out what bothered the people, I gave it to them every week. I put the knife in the same place Sunday after Sunday. He says, did they put up with it? Not really, the preacher answered. I preach. I had that church down to four people. I preached them down there. You know, sometimes revival begins not when you get a lot of people in the church, but when we get some of the Lord's, some of the, the old people out of the church. If people are going to stand in the way of the moving of God, it's better they be gone. After that, we only let Christians in the church. <laughs> of course, Clarence said, how can you tell who the Christians are? Well, said the old preacher, down here, we're taught since we were knee-high to a grasshopper, they're different between black folk and white folk. And they shouldn't mix. But we know that when people get saved, all this garbage is gone. They know that we got Christians on our hands when all the stuff about race is taken out of folks' heart. Well, when we got some of the Christians in this, well, when we got some Christians in this church, it started to grow and grow. That's how we got to be the way we are. That evening, Clarence, the speaker, went to spend the night at the home of a member of the church. The member was a graduate of Yale with a doctorate in English literature, who was on the faculty of the University of South Carolina. The man drove 70 miles to go to that church. That night, Clarence asked the young, sophisticated member of the intelligence, yeah, the intelligence community, why do you go to that church? Why do you go to hear that old hillbilly preacher? You're used to good English, and that preacher can't utter a sentence without making a grammatical error. The man answered sternly, Sir, I go to that church because he preaches the gospel. Awesome, awesome, awesome. I go to there because he preaches the gospel. Boy, this morning we're going to partake of communion, and we're going to. I'm going to read two verses, make some brief comments, and then we'll partake together. All who want to. Uh, it's First Corinthians 10, uh, 16 and 17. The cup of blessing which we bless is it not the communion? of the blood of Christ, the bread that we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we being member are one bread, one body, for we all partakers of that one bread. The cup of blessing, I should tell you this, communion is koinia, it's partnership, participation, fellowship, and distribution, all wrapped up in that word communion, in that Greek word koinia. The cup of blessing corresponds to the Jewish Passover feast that was while sharing the Passover with his disciples that he instituted the Christian observance of the Lord's Supper. Is it not communion, fellowship of the blood of Christ? As Christians share together, both in asking God's blessing and partaking of the bread and the cup, they are sharing spiritually in Christ's body and blood. We are members of his body, Ephesians says, of his flesh, of his bones. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. And this shares in many spiritual blessings with Christ's death, what Christ's death bought. The communion and fellowship with Christ includes fellowship with other Christians, with various members of the body of Christ joining to share his blessings. For we being many are one bread, 
one body. We are all partakers of that one bread. Paul merged the image of the one loaf with that of the one body, the one loaf broken into many pieces for the participation of all. It's still one, even though consumed by many. So also, the one body, though composed of many members, is still one entity. In 1 Corinthians 12, 12, for as the body is one and hath many members, all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. Sharing together in the one loaf is an expression of the unity of Christ's body, which experiences communion both with Christ and with other members.